Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dirk, for for that. Um, and I, I'd also like to take a moment to thank Magdalena for doing the, the, the tech, Elias for being remote and supporting us remotely, um, Bradley for backup support, and Jen and Patty and all the other volunteers who make this possible. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming today. This, my name is Dan Martin. Um, I'm a student of Lama Yeshe Jinpas. This is my second talk here, so if I'm showing a little nerves, please bear with me. <laughs> um, to, to, start, uh, to start today, I wanted to take a moment to uh, acknowledge and praise uh, all of my teachers that I've had that have got me to this moment that I'm at right now. And um, uh, that's, that would be Kempo Gurmit Trinle Rinpoche, Geshe Ngawan um Alan Wallace, um, and of course, uh, Lama Yeshe Jinpa. Um, any, I, I, I took on kind of, kind of an ambitious topic today, so um, I would like to also say from the beginning, I'm going to do my best to convey what what I've understood and learned um, through through teachings and retreats. But uh, any faults or uh, anything I get incorrectly is is purely on me and no reflection of any of the great teachers that that I've been fortunate to encounter. So um, the topic that I chose um, was obviously lucid dreaming. Um, and I, I, I mentioned a little bit about dream yoga in, in the announcement, but I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to touch upon it lightly here and there, but uh, I'm going to, you know, it's a pretty advanced topic and I'm not going to pretend to be a uh, um, some type of yogi that can teach dream yoga. So I'll just, now I'm getting all my disclaimers out of the way here. <laughs> um, so to start with, I would like to ask everyone, um, maybe by a, a show of hands, who is 100% sure that right now they are not dreaming? Who is 100% sure that their body is not at home, tucked in bed, sleeping, and that what we're experiencing right here is not 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 any type of uh, spiritual uh, dream analogy, but just a literal dream. Who who's one hundred percent sure they're not? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, well, I as well. I'm pretty sure I woke up this morning and drove here, and pretty sure I'm not dreaming. Um, the the problem with that is if we were dreaming or if we are dreaming, we're going to do the same thing. We're all going to raise our hands. We're all going to be like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not dreaming. This is, this is totally normal. Um, we have this, we have this ingrained habit of always, no matter how crazy things get, assuming we're not dreaming. Um, when asked what kind of being he was, a human or a God, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni replied simply, I am awake. So, we, we, I, I like that quote. I brought it up in the beginning here because um, as we go into this subject today, you, it's easy to recall so many quotes we hear from uh, great beings and lamas about awakening and that this world being dreamlike. Even in the, in the Heart Sutra, we, we mentioned all phenomena being dreamlike. Um, Humans spend a third of their lives sleeping. If you live to be 75, you'll spend 25 years of your life asleep. So that that's a pretty uh, wild thing to, <laughs> to contemplate, and um, it makes you wonder, like, can we utilize that time, um, you know, in, in some way for, for practice? Um, so next, I'd like to talk a little bit about what is a non-lucid dream. I think we all are pretty familiar with that. I, I assume we're all fairly familiar with that. Um, I know I'm familiar with that. Uh, a non-lucid dream is a state where we believe everything that is happening to us is real and out there. Things are separate from us and occurring, uh, um, happening to us. Um, we can be afraid. We can be terrified. Uh, we can We can believe that as I said, everything's real, but in, in reality, it's a display of our mind. Um, 
And from the Buddhist context, from the Buddhist perspective, in a similar way, in the daytime, we kind of do the same thing. We, we think and believe that everything is happening to us, that is disconnected, external. Um, we perceive it to be separate from us. So there's some, uh, I bring that up to say there's some similarities again between our habits in the daytime and our habits that carry over into the night. Um, so what is a lucid dream? Um, for the following, I took a few quotes from an article uh, from Tricycle Magazine uh, written by Alan Wallace uh, called Awakening to the Dream. So I'll kind of read this, this quick kind of scientific um, opening here. Um, I'll provide a link when I upload the YouTube video for this. So if anyone's curious and wants to read the full article, um, it'll be out there. Um, from, a, from a scientific point of view, it wasn't until, I think it was about 30 years ago, um, maybe a little longer, um, that science even believed it was possible to have a lucid dream. They, the consensus was that it's not possible to be both asleep and awake at the same time. They're two opposite contradictory states and, you know, there's, there's no way that can be possible, even though for thousands of years people have been reporting the, that it is possible. Um, it was a uh, psychologist, Stephen Labarge, who was one of the uh, pioneers in this, in this area. And he's another um, person I'll, I'll put some links to if any, in, in the video if people want to read more about him. Um, he has a lot of uh, workshops and books that you can read. Um, he was one of the, so I'll go ahead and I'll just read this part verbatim. Um, author and psychophysiologist Stephen Labarge was one of many people who had occasionally experienced lucid dreams since childhood. As a young man, it occurred to him this would be a fascinating area of research. In 1977, he began his graduate studies in this new field at Stanford, gradually developing methods for inducing lucid dreams and recording his own personal experiences, resulting in nearly 900 lucid dream reports over the next seven years. But how to persuade his scientific colleagues that we can really become awake in our dreams? The challenge he recognized was to communicate from a lucid dream to people in the waking state. One obstacle was that during sleep, most of the dreamer's body is paralyzed. But psychologists had already discovered that the eyes move while dreaming and that the eye movements of a sleeping person correspond to the eye movements of the person within a dream. In one famous study done by Stanford University sleep researcher William C. Dement, a dreamer was awakened after making a series of about two dozen regular horizontal eye movements. When he was awakened and asked what he was dreaming about, he said he'd been watching a very long volley in a ping pong game. <laughs> this gave Labarge an idea. If he could train, if he, well, if he could become lucid in a dream while his scientific colleagues were monitoring his brain states and rapid eye movements to ensure that he really was indeed dreaming, he could send some signals to them by moving his dream eyes in a prearranged way. Since his physical eyes would track in the same way as his dream eyes, he could provide objective evidence that he knew that he was indeed dreaming. Ultimately, Labarge was successful in providing such empirical proof of lucid dreaming. His work and other related studies have now been widely accepted within the Western scientific community and scientific researchers in the field of lucid dreaming have devised a number of ingenious methods for helping ordinary people awaken to their dreams. So, that's just a little bit of the, the, the scientific uh, history, the recent history of lucid dreaming. Um, it's important to, to note here that being lucid in a dream is more than just a thought. It's more than just a, um, a feeling. It's a, it's, a, it's a realization. It's a, a very powerful ascertainment of the state that you're in. Um, and it's also important to note that there's, there can be a spectrum of lucidity. You can be a little bit lucid, or you can be super vividly lucid. Um, uh, an example of being a little bit lucid is, I, you know, there have been times in my life where I have a nightmare. And I um, will, will kind of know that this can't be real, this isn't right, and then wake up. So that, that's kind of an example of like a, a, small, uh, a small degree of lucidity. Could I define a lucid dream? 
That's a good question. A lucid dream is knowing that you're dreaming, know, knowing that you are uh, asleep, your body's asleep, and that you're, you're, you're purely in a dream. And um, when you're very, very lucid, you can do anything. You can fly. You can walk through walls. You can... Um, you're you're just a, you're you're vividly aware that what you're experiencing isn't isn't real, isn't the daytime your daytime uh, reality. You're welcome. Good question. Thank you for thank you for asking. Um. So as I said, you can be very lucid. You can be a little bit lucid, or you can be very lucid. Um. And there's there's degrees to it as well. As I said, you can walk through. If you're very very lucid, like I could right now, go walk through that wall and. <laughs> pop out the other side or I could know that I'm in a dream and I could think I can walk through the wall and start to walk through the wall and then get stuck halfway through which is like <laughs> it's like your mind is like yeah I know I'm dreaming but it doesn't fully kind of grasp that it's it, it's really not real there's still these habits of reifying things and that are they're they're deeply ingrained so um just shows that there's a lot of there's a lot of degrees to it. Um, so now you might ask, okay, cool, what's the big deal? What does that have to do with Buddha Dharma? What <laughs> what what is what is the big deal? It sounds fun, but okay. <laughs> um, so it's true, you know, lucid dreaming can be used just as like a recreational activity. It could be, you know, there's a lot of interest in virtual reality today. Well, you have a pretty cool VR uh, thing going on in your mind at night. So, you know, something to something to explore, you know. Uh, um, and I would say it's far more powerful than any VR today because it's only limited by your imagination. You, you can literally do anything that you can imagine you can do if, if you're lucid in a dream. Um, some, like, practical applications of it are, like, creativity and problem solving. Like, uh, say you have... Um, so you have a interpersonal conflict with somebody at work and you're trying to figure out how you want to talk to them. If you're lucid in a dream, you can actually create the scenario. You can have the person there. You can try talking to them. You can, you know, try different techniques of how you want to communicate with them. Um, um, you can, you know, write music, poetry. There, there's all kinds of creative things that you can do in a lucid dream. Um, you could conjure up uh, like archetypal beings, wisdom beings, and ask them questions or things that, that are um, troubling you or obstacles and, and ask for their advice. And of course, in that scenario, you're really talking to your own subconscious, but that is uh, something that can be done. Um, you can. Yeah, I'm gonna get into. I'm. I, I should probably have broken down wh how I plan to attack this. But what, what I plan to. I'm gonna plan to give you some tips on how you can, how you can some techniques for inducing lucidity. Um, but for now, I'm just trying to sell you on how cool it is. <laughs> um. So yeah. So there. So the, so there are a lot of non. Um, non dharma non spiritual things you can do with lucid dreams some, I, maybe not that's not a good way to say it uh, i would say just like practical things you can you can use it for. but of course we're here at a dharma center um and that's that we probably shouldn't limit ourselves to just using it as a playground um so it can be used for spiritual practice of course dream yoga uh goes back thousands of years i think it even um predates Tibetan Buddhism, Tibet. I was reading yesterday that the Bon tradition, the native religion of Tibet, they had dream yoga as well. So it goes way back. Um, and in dream yoga, again, I'm going to touch lightly on this because I, I don't want to, uh, you know, get ahead, of, get, what is the thing? Get ahead of my skis or something. Um, so dream yoga is using the dream state to ascertain the nature of mind. So in true dream yoga, you realize you're dreaming, you're lucid, and you sustain that realization. Um, and then you begin to control and transform events in your dream. But in order to, to start 
to begin that practice. It can't be done in like an egotistical way where you are trying to like dominate and control the dream. Um, as you go deeper, you're investigating kind of how malleable and illusory the dream world is. So that's kind of the, you know, you could, with everything I'm going to talk about today, you, you can you kind of, you can kind of approach it as at first as just how to do it, how to get lucid, and how to um, how to kind of start to stabilize that. And then the idea is for Dharma practice of, under the guidance of a, a qualified Lama is to then begin to um, use that experience then or use that ability to engage in these types of sp spiritual practices. Excuse me. So now for the the tips and tricks, how to do it. Uh, step one may not seem obvious at first, but when you think about it, it it sort of starts to make sense. Um, is shamatha, and obviously shamatha in the daytime. <laughs> so having having a strong shamatha practice will give you the the stability of attention that you're going to need in the nighttime. Without shamatha, without a strong foundation in shamatha, you can, if you do some of these other techniques, you can get lucid and then it'll just, you'll be lucid for like a second and then it'll just pop like a bubble. You know, it'll just be like, it'll just, it just won't hold. Um, it just, the attention will get too excited, it, you know, because there's a rush that comes with that realization when you're dreaming and there has to be some like, like calm stability of the attention to be able to sustain that that awareness before you can do anything with the dream. So if you take nothing away from this talk, uh, practice shamatha. <laughs> that's that's important. Um, so some other methods to induce lucidity. Um, pay attention and notice when things get weird, when things are just too bizarre. Um, you know, if you're at home one minute and then the next minute you're in New York, you know, you might be dreaming. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, you know, you're talking to your friend and then your friend suddenly becomes your mom, you know, you, you might be dreaming. Um, if, you know, a pickup truck rolls by your house and there's a giant aquarium in the back with a shark swimming around in it, you know, Take a second and check in. Maybe you're dreaming. You know, things are anytime things are getting weird, check in and, and ask yourself if you're dreaming. Um, and the next thing you're gonna need is dream re recall. If you can't remember your dreams, which is I think it's for a lot of people, for myself included, it's hard sometimes. I don't remember I'll just remember like the last little bit of it. And I can't for the life of me remember what happened before that. Um, if you can't remember your dreams, it's possible you'll become lucid and then not even remember it. So dream recall is, is important. Um, in order to improve dream recall, number one, don't be sleep deprived. Um, I think we're all pretty, uh, maybe not all, but many of us are, are, are sleep deprived. Um, and if we're not getting enough sleep, our sleep cycles aren't going to be right and we're not going to, have a lot of REM sleep. So, you know, anytime you want to start to cultivate this practice, you're going to have to get some extra sleep, which doesn't sound terrible. Um, <laughs> um, next to improve dream recall, there has to be some intention. You have to have, I think somebody was asking about that a minute ago. There has to be some, what they call, some aspect of prospective memory. So remembering that in the future, I'm going to do something. Um, remem remembering an example of prospective memory is when I go to the grocery store later, I have to remember to buy eggs. It's remembering that when, when I encounter this situation, I'm gonna remember to do something. Um, so in this example, our, we're gonna have a prospective memory that tonight when I'm dreaming, I'm gonna realize I'm dreaming or tonight, when things get weird, I'm going to check in to see if I'm dreaming. And by the way, I'm going to be really mad if I wake up in like a couple of minutes and this right here was a dream and I didn't get lucid. 
I'm going to be really annoyed. <laughs> that can happen. I've had dreams where I talk about lucid dreaming and I'm not lucid. So that again shows you how, how deeply ingrained our habit is to believe things are real. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, more techniques to, to improve your recall is dream journaling. So something about getting up and writing down just, just little, even just little, you know, you don't want to, you may not want to totally wake up, but, you know, write down a few notes about what, what, what was happening. Um, don't move when you first awaken. Don't just wake up and jump right out of bed. Like if you hold still for something about movement, just like kicks the amnesia in. Um, if you, if you just, as soon as you wake up, kind of hold still and kind of think about what, what was just happening, you can start to trace the thread backward and, and start to remember the dream and sometimes at the very least you may not remember a dream but you can kind of remember the feeling of it like the, the vibe of it you know that's the, the the most kind of crude uh or most basic level of, of memory there but it's just that getting a sense of what the feeling was so once you start doing that um you may start to notice some some things coming up um what Stephen LaBerge and Alan Wallace have called dream signs. Um, they're just things that tend to reoccur over and over again. For me, it's really weird, bizarre elevators and uh, peeing in weird bathrooms. <laughs> For whatever reason, uh, those things come up. Uh, like, for example, the other night I had a dream. I got in an elevator, and there was a guy on the other side of the elevator, and he was, like, all scared. And I was like, what's going on? And I got in, the doors closed, and all of a sudden the elevator was, like, going up, and it was, like, rocking like this. What is going on? Get me off this thing. So, for whatever reason, I'm not scared of elevators, but elevators always come up in my dreams. Who knows? <laughs> so that would be a dream, a dream sign. Um, once you start to recognize these patterns of things that come up in your dreams. So now what do you do with that? Okay. Well, what you do with that is what's called a state check. So a state check is you want to build a habit of every time you, your dream sign appears or every time things get weird, you are, you check in to see what state you're in. So it starts with just really asking yourself if you're dreaming, not like you have to like really ask yourself if you're dreaming, not just kind of, uh, you know, repeat the question, but like really probe and, and, and check. Um, something you can do to like really verify your state is, is called, um, so it's a state check, but it's, it has to do with reading something and, you know, just like reading the title of this book. Memorize it, turn your head, look back, see if it's changed. Scientists say, if you're dreaming, there's a 75% chance when you do that and look back, it's going to change. If you do it, you do it, what you do, the technique is to do it three times. So you look back once, you do it another time, come back, there's a 95% chance it'll change the third time when you look back. So if you do that three times and it doesn't change, there's a 95% chance you're not dreaming. Um, but you may be surprised if you start to develop that habit in the daytime, you find yourself in some situation where you're, you're, um, your dream sign occurs or, or things are just weird and you do that and you look back and all of a sudden there's a totally different title on the book and then you know you know, you know, you're dreaming. So that's a technique you can do. So the idea is you're, you're, you're trying to build a habit of not always assuming that you're not dreaming. Um, and here's how it can kind of start to tie back to dream yoga or to Dharma practice. Um, in dream yoga, there, there's the nighttime practice of dream yoga where you are, you know, creating objects, manipulating objects, uh, you know, going through these practices that are prescribed to you. Um, 
There's also the daytime practice, which consists of seeing things as dreamlike. So, so again, doing these types of state checks is a way to not always assume everything around you is firm and external and separate. You're, you're kind of, you know, seeing phenomena as dreamlike in the daytime. And as you work, as you build these habits of performing these checks, you start to break down the habit of believing everything is real and exists out there. So back to the original question from the beginning, when I, when I said, are you, is everyone sure you're not dreaming now? And ask yourself what it would feel like if right now, right here, where we're all sure we're not dreaming, what if suddenly you realized that you were dreaming right now? And, and ask yourself, what would that feel like? The sudden, like, aha, the sudden realization of coming out of the state of delusion where you thought everything you were seeing, smelling, touching, hearing, was out there, to knowing that it was a display of your mind. And there's nothing physical in your, nothing physical around you. And you're free to do whatever you want. Just what, what would that feel like, that moment of being so sure you're not dreaming to realizing, wow, I was, I was way off. <laughs> like, I am dreaming. So I, I imagine, I, I think we can all draw parallels to what that would be like in the waking state for enlightenment, to just that, 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 what that would feel like um, to do the same thing in, the, in, the, in this reality as well. So to, to wrap up before I um, open it up for questions, comments, complaints, as Lama likes to say, um, important points from Lama Jinpa. So I, I discussed this topic um, a bit with Lama, and these are some key points he wanted uh, to emphasize as well, which were uh, very, uh, very relevant and very helpful. Um, and that is that these topics sh should be thought of as, as kind of on-ramps to deeper practice, uh, not as goals in and of themselves. Like the goal isn't just to have some cool, lucid dream experience. Um, being aware inside a dream, being in a lucid dream, doesn't mean you're aware of your misperceived self. So that was another comment from Lama. You know, just because you get lucid in a dream doesn't mean you're enlightened or that you, you know, you have some some deep spiritual insight. You can use it as a platform for that, but it's not just a given. You can still be lucid and have a strong, ignorant sense of self. You know? <laughs> yeah, as I said, it's it's not to be confused with, with uh, enlightenment. Um, the other thing he, he impressed upon me was we don't want to make the nighttime experience into another like fantastic realm to reify or, or grasp after. Otherwise, we're doing the same thing that we do in the daytime experience, and that is not a means of liberation. He said, we don't want to practice delusion yoga, which I liked. <laughs> um, and he also wanted to impress upon us that for true Mahamudra Dzogchen practice, we don't have to cultivate any special state of mind. So, um, again, while these um, lucid dreaming dream practice can be very enticing and, and fascinating, um, we, ha we have to keep in mind also that, you know, we don't have to do anything special when it comes to real Dzogchen practice. I would need him to explain more of what that what that really means, but that's uh, that's pretty important to keep in mind, I would say. So with that, I will go ahead and open it up to any questions or comments or complaints. Uh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> natural lucid dreamers. Other people like me, it, it, it's not natural. It takes a lot of hard work. It's not easy. You read the 
books on lucid dreaming and fatigue are easy, but uh, you may struggle for many months before you have a lucid dream. Mm -hmm. Most of uh, the dreams come uh, towards the end of your sleep cycle. So if you're going to be practicing lucid dreaming, you should be aiming towards the end of your sleep cycle when you're getting ready to wake up. Uh, <clears throat> it's helpful. You wake up after you, at, at the end of the dream, you stay awake for half an hour. You meditate or you read about lucid dreaming and then you go back to sleep trying to, okay, I'm going to have a lucid dream. I'm going to remember this is a dream. Remember, remember, remember. Maybe you'll have a lucid dream, probably not. So it can get frustrating. Night after night, no lucid dreaming. But it's, a, it, it, it's helpful. Uh, of course, dream recall. If you're not dreaming, you're not going to have a lucid dream. So keep your dream journal going. You're paying attention to your dreams. Uh, there's also a uh, herbal supplement called galantamine, which is used for lucid dreaming. You can get it from Amazon.com. Uh, the technique is... Uh, after you've done your deep sleep and you wake up, you take the galantamine and you meditate or read a book on lucid dreaming for half an hour and then you go to sleep. And the galantamine extends the amount of time you spend in REM sleep. And so it's easier to recognize when you're going on and on and on and will this dream ever end? You're getting tired. Oh, oh, how can I make it? Oh, this is a dream. Oh, okay. Then it's all of a sudden it's not exhausting. And anyway, I'm just starting to ramble on on some of my experiences. I appreciate it. It's no, not it's as good. easy as it seems. I, I agree. It's 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 not as easy. In fact, Lama wanted to wanted to mention that as well. Um, um, that's where I would emphasize that there's almost, you almost need to do more in the daytime than you need to do at nighttime for this practice. It's really about um, the daytime practice. If, if you're really diligent in the daytime practice, it will sort of more easily carry over into the night. So. I have a question. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, question. So, if we can, if say we get a lucid dream or a series of them, uh, and we find that we're doing things that are not virtuous, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some people think that, um, well, it's not real, so it doesn't matter. Have fun. Mm -hmm. But isn't there a moral imperative? Yeah, that that's above my pay grade. That one. <laughs> um, it's a very good question. Um, that's a very good question. Yeah, I, I, I imagine, I imagine they're probably. Again, I don't know. I would, I would love to hear Lama's take on that. But um, I, I would imagine there's probably definitely karma being created there. So yeah, if you're doing terrible stuff, then maybe. But I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard to say because again, it's not. Um, it's not real. There's no, I know Dirk can probably also comment on the, what's required to generate karma. I think there's like intention, the, uh, the intent, like the intention, the, the, yeah, there's, there's like different layers to karma. So like maybe there's one of, or two of the layers that is generated not the others, but I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. Smiling about your poor choice. <laughs> Hi, my name is Steven. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Just an opinion. I'm not a guru or teacher or anything like that. But the, just to follow up what she was asking is just do you, what do you feel from that dream once you wake up? Once you realize you're dreaming and then you realize you're doing something wrong, do you regret it? But you have to believe that was just a dream. 
That's just my take on it. Mm-hmm. It's not, I, I believe there, there won't be any karma being made or anything like that. As long as you realize you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I can't say. Yeah, yeah but, but, but I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I mean, it's. Thank you. Well, you know, I mean, some people have the point, right? They, they sort of like, you get a free pass, right? You get to rob the bank, you get to have sexual relations, you get to do whatever you want this is true. with a free pass. Yeah. But I think if. I think if you I think become conscious of the fact that you're gaming your own dreams. This isn't real. I can do anything yeah. I want. I think but is it really not real? I mean, isn't there what you sort of Well, I don't know. There's no there, it's not real in the sense that there's nobody working at the bank that's going to get hurt. There's no money that's going to get stolen, but are you developing some negative pattern in yourself that can be, you're going to carry over to the daytime? Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, but that's, again, kind of why I I said that, um, you know, you can use it as a playground or you can use it as a, a platform for practice. So, um, yeah, it, it, it can be tempting at first to want to use it as only a playground and get distracted. So maybe that's why, um, you know, it's only taught in such controlled settings but um I, I think it probably it comes back to your intention now what you what you plan to use it for but that, that was a really good question though yeah so uh yeah i was just gonna say before i pass the mic i i actually had a lucid dream experience <clears throat> around this where around this this topic oh, yeah this topic okay yeah so i was taking some kind of substance and then i became lucid and i told myself you can't even Break your vows in your dreams. <laughs> so, yeah. anyway, or whatever that. So that was really interesting because that those bad dreams didn't even come up until you mentioned it. I had one really, really, really bad dreams where I, I I will never tell a single soul. It was awful the thing I did in my dream, and in order for me to get past it, I'm like, well, maybe it was my subconscious back karma that was coming out. And that's how the only way I could reconcile it was to dream it. Um, And that's how I kind of got past it. But um, I had a question about um, the the reoccurring um, themes and the reoccurring dreams. I've had seven reoccurring dreams throughout my entire life. and that's pretty much all I dream about <laughs> are these things. Um, how does that play into and how could you possibly realize like why it is it's only those seven things? Are you kind of asking like more of like dream interpretation of why those things are occurring? Yeah. Yeah, that that one's that one's not one. I, um, not to not to dodge your question, but that's not really something I'm uh, equipped to do. Is and I, I'm not I'm not really adept, or I don't have much knowledge about dream interpretation or any of that. So, um, but what you you did mention something though that that reminded me that um, once you begin having lucid dreams it's very possible you're going to stir, I mean, you probably will stir up your subconscious, in which case there will be weird things that you conjure up and, uh, you know, being attacked by monsters and all these weird things that, you know, may not be too fun. Um, But the idea is to, um, is to begin to learn that you don't have to run from those things so you can um you know let the monster attack you knowing that you have an illusory body and you're not going to get harmed and so um but yeah as as the the as far as recurring dreams i yeah i can't really speak too much to that but i i can i can't say that there are like I said, re- you can sometimes find recurring themes. So it may not be the exact dream that just happens again and again, but there are, y- you may start to recognize common patterns. Like I said, elevators, such a weird thing, but 
you know, that for whatever reason, there are certain themes like that to just continue to pop up. And so um, you can use those as a, um, once you recognize them, you can use them as a, as a means to build the habit of checking and doing the state checks when those things start to happen. Me? How do I do that? Oh, Stephen, go ahead and um, if you have a question. Yes, sorry, we've moved past the topic, but thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what it said. Oh, we did? Okay, great. Good, good. Okay. Um, thanks. This is a big talk. Um, I appreciate your illumination of the lucid dreaming. Um, I've been dreaming for a long time, and I've reached this place of dreaming in the collective unconscious. And um, some are quite beautiful. And some of the symbols are very beautiful. I don't really have a way to manage that uh, or direct it. They come with just with no will. So doing my practice, as you said, you know, during the daytime will help me, I think, uh, develop a style or a way to bring forth these collective unconscious dreams because they do come into play at any time. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I definitely suggest emphasizing the daytime practice. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. One, one thing I didn't mention in the talk was um, when talking about ways to induce lucid dreaming is when you get really, really adept, like the, the I assume the, the, you know, realized beings and lamas, you, you, you actually maintain awareness as you fall asleep. So um, you basically, as your senses implode, um, you know, in a very relaxed way, the, as the outer world subsides, you maintain lucidity, even in dreamless sleep, maintaining lucidity until the, until the dream arises out of the, out of that state um, and maintain it all the way through, just like um, similar to what they report at the time of death as well, maintaining awareness through the Bardo state. Um, again, above my pay grade, I'm not gonna <laughs> try to go there too much, but there is, um, you know, there it, it, there's, it can get very, very deep. And Preparation for the Bardo. It is a Bardo, it's a dream Bardo, yep. Right. So yeah. So it's when when uh, taken from I think with that motivation and from that approach um, becomes much more than just a virtual playground. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm concerned about this too. I mean, I can see. I'm trying to figure out how the usefulness, I guess, and and it seems to impute one the usefulness of lucid dreaming or dream yoga <laughs> okay so that's the key i think yeah and that's why and that's why i i only lightly touched on dream yoga but but yeah the the usefulness of lucid dreaming and i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you but um yeah that the usefulness of okay. right, right, and so lucid, not not dream yoga, but but lucid dreaming. If you have a a, a personal issue, mm -hmm. a conflict, let's say that you can presuppose, not presuppose, predetermine that I want to, you know, I, I really, I really want to understand this. I, I think I'm going to try to do it. And, you know, I mean, I understand 
first night that we came in, which was seven in the morning, you were at the club with us, and, and they were not at ever in two or three. Well, it's hard, but it's also not as hard as you think. But, but so, so the, the, the big turning in something like that is one of the useful lessons that can happen just with lucid dreaming. Right. And the dream yoga, okay, yeah. So, yeah, you can do this too. You can really push that in to get like really experience. So, and work really so dream yoga is, is a very advanced, you know, right. yogic practice to achieve enlightenment. So there's no doubt about what the usefulness of that is, right? But that's, but. That there isn't any separation between, like it's all of this. Right, I mean, it's, I mean, it is, it is a practice, you, 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 you Again, again, I, I don't want to go too deep into it, um, just because I don't want to misconstrue it. But it, you gain lucidity, and then there are prescribed. There's there's actual, you know, practices that you then engage in during the dreams. I mean, you're actually meditating. You're actually analyzing the nature of self. You're, you're, you know creating objects and changing their color and, and you're, you're continually probing the nature of your mind to understand it you know it's and it's a whole that's a whole nother level and so that's kind of why um I, I probably didn't do a great job of making it clear but like kind of what the way i approached this talk was about lucid dreaming as a kind of a, a way to get your foot in the door and then you know um once you have your foot in the door, then to maybe start thinking about those other practices and then as a way to move past that. Um, and and back to the the practical thing you mentioned about the intentionality is is when you when you conjure up if you like you said we're having a a, a difficulty with somebody you want to work out uh, a problem with them, um, you can if you if you become lucid you can create the situation. But you don't really know. It's still a dream. You don't really know what that person's going to say to you. You don't. You can control it to a certain degree, right? You can, like, I'm gonna once I get lucid, I'm gonna have this person appear and I'm gonna talk to them. Okay, you can do that. But where it goes from there, you don't. It's, it's slippery. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, and that's how it can be useful because you can then try different ways of engaging with that that person or that situation. They need some kind of validation that they are dependent. Mm. If you have a lucid dream, you don't have validation. Oh, I am dependent. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if I can think of how it would work, maybe if you could say, well, everything is in your head, you just talk to this guy or talk to this guy. You can be like, yo, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conquer this guy. Mm -hmm. I suffer from anxiety or something. I'm not going to have anxiety anymore. And you, you announce it. You renounce having anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So I would just like to share. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, just when you mentioned, I don't, what is your name? Dev, Dev I'm Leslie. Um, when you mentioned the collective unconscious and the symbolism um, involved in the symbols in the collective unconscious, I've been studying Jung for a few years, but I've been looking at his idea of synchronicity um, and noticing those patterns in, in just your waking life. And I've noticed since it's been a couple of years, I've been looking at synchronicity and noticing patterns in my own life. Um, and I've noticed, and I've started just this year, just like January, um, keeping a record um, of the patterns I see and the reoccurring dreams that I have. Um, there are always, almost every dream is 
are snakes and not just a couple snakes like two feet of snakes piled up and i'm just like scooting them along like excuse me excuse me <laughs> but there's always snakes and, and sometimes i have to you know tell them um can, can you move along so i can get my stuff done and um but that's one of the like your elevators mine mine are snakes but like all sorts of deadly snakes and they're like friendly to me <laughs> but um that's one of those collective unconscious symbols the the serpent um and so um looking at those patterns and synchronicity in your own life i'm trying to figure out like what are those things that i saw and recognized today and what did i dream that night well actually more like in the morning is when i remember them I think Andrew had a question. Yeah, I don't know how much you've um, studied on psychedelics. Or I've, just I've experimented with them. <laughs> like you know, of course, I've been used in uh, religious traditions, and mm -hmm. these days, kind of um, psychological advancement. Um, and it feels like there might be a parallel to dreaming there. I don't know, but I'm. So is it apples and oranges? Are people um, experimenting with uh, trying to direct things within a hallucinogenic trip that, that can help to uh, open these things up the way that uh, lucid dreaming and dream yoga do? Really good question. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer, but... Um, or any answer that I necessarily want to put on tape right now. <laughs> Shut up the video. No. <laughs> I mean, um, I'm sure there are par parallels there, but I don't know. I'd have to. That's a good question. I'd have to think about that. Um, to these i guess if you want to be on the topic of psychedelics or even just lucid dreaming it's kind of like you got to have a conditioned mind to obtain something from the rest of your life or if you you know for example if you apply buddha dharma to it then you're okay i'm going to do something mm -hmm. you know, i'm going to obtain yeah. use this as a as a medium to obtain something. I think that's important to all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, it's 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 easy to get distracted. It's if if there's not if it's not done with the right intention with bodhicitta, then yeah, it's um, it it's a can be a distraction. But yeah. Anything? Any other questions? Anybody online? Nope. Okay, I guess we'll uh, do closing prayer. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, bodhicitta, that has not arisen, arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Tenzin Jato, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the Snowy Land Sages, Losang Grakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Okay. Thank you again, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming.
Omo Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Omo 